here we go. So we're going to work on theme six about national and European identity. And basically what this theme deals with is that, well, like you can see here, it focuses on how and why definitions and perceptions of regional, cultural, national, and European identity have developed and been challenged over time. So basically this refers to how people sort of feel about how they belong and like what sort of group they are part of in a political sense, not like a sort of social class sense or religious sense so much. This is going to be focused more on political identity, political belonging at the national level, supranational level, and, you know, subnational level as well. So, since 1450, Europeans have understood their place in the world based on their membership in various and sometimes overlapping entities, ranging from small local groupings to fully developed nation states and multinational organizations. That covers like the whole range over this whole curriculum. Questions concerning identity have remained constant, even as shifting political, social, economic, religious, and cultural developments, such as the intensely patriotic calls for greater national unity in the 19th century, have brought new units and affiliations into being. In the early modern period, Europeans identified with language groups and political units of varying sizes, such as the Renaissance-era city-state. Early modern Europeans also identified with emerging nation or nation states, such as a unified Spain under King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, imperial dynasties such as the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire, and the idea of a unified Christendom. So, early modern refers to about the 1400s to 700s. That's the time frame that we're dealing with here. Now, to kind of back it up a little bit, though, one of the concepts that's always going to be sort of there in the background underneath, like, political identities is some degree of social identity, because this is before the whole idea of, like, individual rights and liberty has really come into being, which was really a, a, an offshoot of the Enlightenment in the 1700s. So it's important to keep in mind that as part of the sort of national identity or political grouping that people are part of, they also will still feel a very strong attachment to their particular just group within society. And the estates is a term that applies to this idea of kind of like traditional social groups in European societies. So you have the landed aristocracy, and before this concept of individual rights, people sort of looked at the rights and privileges that they had as people as inherently tied up to the rights and privileges that their group of people had. So the landed aristocracy, those are the ones who have you know, special privileges in their societies, such as freedom from taxation you know, at this point in most countries, um, you know, the right to hunt on their land, and the right to serve as commanders and officers in royal armies, that sort of thing, are sort of privileges of the upper upper class, the land-owning aristocracy. The clergy were their own sort of separate estate or separate group within European society. Townspeople, bourgeoisie, you know, they increasingly, increasingly looked at themselves as a unique um, social group, you know, with their own special rights and privileges, especially as it pertained to, like, the right to do particular types of business in the towns and cities where they operated, the right to have access to certain markets. And then peasants, you know, believe it or not, peasants did have rights and privileges as a group. You know, they could quite often negotiate particular rights um, with the landowners whose land that they were part of or that they worked on. So it's important to keep in mind that as we talk about, like during the early modern period, you know, people who identified as, you know, Florentines or French people, there were also these sort of subgroupings within that where they sort of understood like their sort of place in that border, even within the sort of national unit or political unit. Now, um, there's a mention here of Renaissance Italian city-states. These are some of the first, you know, kind of like centralized political units that emerge in um, Europe during the early modern period. And it's true that like citizens of, you know, some of the republics in Italy, like Florence or Venice, do start to feel some sort of attachment and identification as members of that particular group versus other city-states. And as the sort of rivalry during the Renaissance between these groups intensifies, you're going to see that that, I mean, this is going to be the case across most of European history. Conflict and rivalry tends to intensify this sense of, like, national grouping and the sense of identity being based on a political group rather than, like, a social group or a religious group or something. War, conflict, rivalry tends to just make those political identities a little bit stronger. So 
Now, elsewhere in Europe, you know, including Italy, you have cities, but you also have towns that are sort of sources of identity. And it's important to keep in mind that before you have, like, really powerful centralized governments that emerge in the 15, 16, 1700s, you know, even in places where you do have a bit stronger monarchies, like France or Spain, people who live in towns generally looked at their town as a source of political identity and as a sort of unit that would push for its own identity and rights um, versus a sort of overbearing central royal government. And one of the words that you might see in relation to these sort of early modern towns and cities and so on is actually the word commune or commune. And that doesn't mean like a sort of communist commune or commune. That is basically just a word for a town that's constituted by the members of the town rather than something that is created by some external force. It's the people of the town who settle there, who, you know, start putting together their markets, start building an economy, and it's like their thing, essentially. Now, there's also this mention of some emerging nation states. So some monarchies are going to start becoming a bit more centralized and powerful over the course of the 14 and 1500s. And in the curriculum, this particular group of monarchs is called the New Monarchies that are able to start creating much more centralized systems, bureaucratic systems, and have more sort of extensive control and also ability to influence people in towns and cities in you know, some of the sort of outlying areas from their capitals. Now, the new monarchs are never able to put together governments quite as powerful as like you know, 20th, century, um, 20th century states can do, of course, but they're sort of going in that direction. And by the end of the 1500s, if you lived within the borders of England, you were in England, and you kind of knew that. And there was something that did sort of separate you culturally and politically and linguistically from France, from the Spanish kingdom, from the Netherlands, from all of these other states that are also beginning to emerge. So even though no one in England talked about being a citizen of England in the 1500s, the fact that you were part of this country that was ruled by the Tudor dynasty did make you part of something that was sort of separate from other countries in Europe. So the same thing in France under the Valois dynasty. Um, and in Spain and Portugal, this is where you see kind of a unique type of national identity emerging because during the 1400s, this is when um, monarchies on the Iberian Peninsula are completing the Reconquista the reconquest of Iberia from Muslim forces, which had con controlled most of Iberia for centuries. So as the reconquest occurs, you start to see that the kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula develop this kind of sense of themselves as crusaders for the Catholic Church, as monarchies and people that are not just you know, a political system, but also on a kind of holy mission to you know, unify Catholicism within their kingdoms. So that gives you know, people like Ferdinand and Isabella a sort of holy mission um, that allows them to exert a little bit more sort of influence in creating this kind of national identity. So let's continue that. Now, one thing that will sort of continue even as we get closer to the modern age that does start to begin here is this idea of royal dynasties as a source of national identity. And in countries that are a little bit more diverse, where it is a little bit more difficult to pull together people that speak different languages or sort of look at themselves as being unique types of people, having like one single dynasty ruling over a bunch of different types of people is something that also starts to create some kind of sense of national identity. Like we are all subjects of the Habsburgs, for example, in the Holy Roman Empire or in you know, Austria and some of the kingdoms that they came to control over the course of the 1500s, 1600s. So the Habsburg dynasty is actually going to be the one that's kind of the best example of this, of a singular dynasty being kind of the focal point of loyalty and political um, identity. So now, you're also going to see in some ways, especially as the Ottoman Empire reached its peak in the 1500s, um, you're going to see some sense of Christendom as a sort of unified Christian society against the Islamic Ottoman Empire as another source of identity. And all during the 1500s, you know, especially as the Reformation is going along, 
you start to see especially Catholic monarchs claiming to be like defending Christendom, you know, from the Ottoman Turks as they go about trying to like clear out Protestants from their kingdoms as well. So they use this claim of like defending a unified Christian system as a way of claiming legitimacy and trying to sort of create a bond among different European people. So shall we continue? Yeah. All right. So now we're moving along into the 17th and 18th centuries. And this is where you start to see states becoming much more modern and much more sort of recognizable in terms of the way that they sort of treat citizens and subjects um, closer to the kind of modern era. So first of all, though, 1648 is a big dividing line in European history for a lot of reasons. This is when the Peace of Westphalia occurred. And for our purposes here, one of the big outcomes of the Peace of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War was this clear sort of indication that borders drawn on a map were real. That borders drawn on a map clearly divided or divided one nation state from another, one political group from another political group. And you know, part of the agreement there that allowed this to happen was the fact that the Netherlands and Switzerland were recognized as independent republics in the Peace of Westphalia. So the idea that these people without a monarch or without the Pope could just basically say, we are a country, we are a unified thing because we want to be, not because God commanded it or because the king said so, that was something that was absolutely revolutionary in Europe. But in addition to that, you know, the governments and their delegates across Europe that signed on to the peace basically said, like, yes, we recognize borders as, like, the beginning and end points of kingdoms. So now you see this shift from a kingdom being just, like, the possessions of the king to being something that exists separate from the body of the king himself, something that is no longer just a possession, but a, a nation, a thing that is there that the king is just kind of the steward of or the leader of rather than the owner and possessor of. So this is a big step forward in the way people feel about how they sort of connect to their country and to the government of their country. So now there are some absolutist monarchs that do try to wrap up the idea of the state and you know belonging to the state in their own sort of personal selves. And probably the best examples of this are Louis XIV and Peter the Great, who go to great lengths to create a sense of Frenchness or Russianness in the case of um, Peter the Great, that is really bound up in you know loyalty to them personally and willingness to accept the changes that they are making to society, in their view, you know, for the betterment of society. And they both used extensive propaganda efforts to just kind of make sure that people from coast to coast, from border to border in their country, just understood that this guy's in charge. To be a good Russian or a good Frenchman means to be loyal to this guy and this dynasty. So, um, but once again, it is sort of in the service of centralizing the government and creating more of a bond between the people being ruled and the central government as a source of identity. Now in Prussia, um, which started to emerge as a major power following the Thirty Years' War, the sort of nation-building idea that the Hohenzollern kings there used and basically continued to use until the, you know, until they got overthrown during World War I was Prussia as a military state, as something that needed a strong, powerful army in order to defend itself because it was just kind of like right there in the middle. And it was you know a bunch of different territories that weren't really necessarily connected to each other. So Prussia became a system that, or, you know, to be a good Prussian meant you were willing to serve in the army, to defend the state from attackers from outside, to defend Prussia from the Habsburgs to the south in Austria. This became a sort of part of the idea of Prussia as a nation of people as it came together. So um, now, in a couple of other places, you see nation building based on constitutionalism. And that's where you've got England, especially. And all through the 1600s, you have this ongoing you know, dispute between Parliament and the Stuart dynasty, who were absolutist minded and had a conception of England as more like that of France, where like their leadership was the defining factor of and you know thing about being English or being you know in the United Kingdom. 
actually the UK didn't exist yet until 1707, so don't quote me on that. But over the course of the, of the 1600s, though, this is a place where you see the shift from nationality based on a royal dynasty being the rulers of the nation to nationality based on parliament and the idea of a representative government as a crucial element of what it means to be an Englishman. And you're going to see that this is something that carries over through the 1700s, through the 1800s, this devotion to the idea of, of parliament, this devotion to the, to the idea of representation as essentially what it means to be English as a member of the English nation. And a couple of other places that became republics, no monarch at all, the Netherlands, Switzerland, these are places that, even though their governments were very sort of oligarchic, they, re they represented you know, the bourgeoisie, they represented elites in the towns and cities of these countries. They were still places where the idea of, you know, having representatives, being free people, you know, independent from a monarch, was an important element of their national identity. So different from the idea of guys like Louis XIV or Peter the Great. So, now the Enlightenment, though, started to change the game entirely. Because now you start to see identity being coming more and more individualized. And the idea of individual rights, the idea of citizenship, the idea of all people in all countries having the same sort of basic natural rights starts to emerge. And that leads to opposition to some traditional forms of power, which meant opposition to some traditional ideas of what it meant to be part of a nation. If you didn't believe that absolute monarchy was appropriate, then in the eyes of someone like Louis XIV, you were basically going against what it meant to be a good, loyal French person. So this is going to be an entirely new kind of idea that's emerging here. And France is going to be the first place where this really gets tested in a really, really big way. So starting with the French Revolution, you start to see this new sense of national identity emerging, where the nation is not so much just like the group of people who are you know, subject to a particular monarchy. Uh, but you start to see this idea of nationalism and na national identity being wrapped up in active citizens. That to be a good Frenchman, you know, during some parts of the French Revolution, meant to be a Frenchman who was interested in politics, you know, was aware of what the government was doing. You know, if you were a man, at least, you know, you voted. And you basically were an active member of society looking out for the best interests of society and the public good. And essentially, this idea of individual rights starts to redefine the relationship between, you know, I guess you could say subject and government within the nation. And national governments, in places where this civic nationalism started to take root, national governments became the, you know, the group that guaranteed the rights of the people rather than just the group that ruled society or defended society. So, uh, all right. Now, 19th century. So after the French Revolution, Enlightenment ideas continue to become more and more influential. Ideas of individual rights and liberties and self-determination and so on. But you also start to see the idea of nationalism emerge in a much more powerful way. So the 19th century is really the golden age of nationalism as a political ideology. And this is when nationalism becomes a much more sort of clearly defined principle and organizing ideology. So the word nationalism really doesn't get used until the 19th century. Now we could argue about like whether or not nationalism as a sort of way of thinking existed before the French Revolution, but at least it doesn't really become a thing that people say and talk about until after the French Revolution. So, nationalism as it is defined in the 19th century, in the broadest sense, is basically just the idea that each national group of people who are bound together by some common language or history or culture or sort of common national identity, that each national group is distinct from other national groups. That's kind of the core of nationalism. Now, there's some who think, well, then it's you know my job to make sure my national group is the best or the strongest. 
or is independent from other national groups. So there are different directions this goes. But the simple idea of a national group being clearly identifiable based on some unique culture or language or identity that binds them together, in, that's sort of inherent to the people in that nation, that's something that's really kind of new. So now the big, one of the big developments of this time period, of course, is the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany. And this is something that is very tightly bound up with this growing sense of nationalism across much of Europe. So now remember, the unification of these two countries, in each case, it occurs basically over the course of the 1860s primarily. And the two big dogs who are leading this effort, in Italy, you've got Camillo Cavour from the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. And in Germany, you've got Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor of Prussia, who kind of engineers the process of unification there. Now. One of the tools they're going to use in their toolbox of unification is warfare. And once again, like we kind of mentioned earlier, conflict and rivalry between different states, as it becomes more and more profound, tends to you know, crystallize the idea of national identity and sort of difference from other nations a little bit. And these two guys understood how to kind of use that sentiment to their advantage. So in the various wars that they fought against Austria, against France, they basically use this idea that, you know, we are all brothers in Italy. We are all German brothers, and we should be defending each other. We should be helping each other to remain independent, to have self-determination, you know, in the face of attack by outsiders. That's a very powerful idea that both of these guys use very effectively. And of course, in Germany, you know, this culminates with the Franco-Prussian War which, as we're going to see later on, becomes something that never really goes away in, front, in um, European politics for the next few decades, the aftermath of that war and how much it just inflames nationalist passions in Germany and in France. So, now, also then during the 1800s, the Romantic movement is occurring, and Romantic nationalism is something that is also kind of tied in with the emergence of these unified nation states like Italy and Germany. And romantic nationalism is something that happens, it really emerges during the Napoleonic Wars as part of the sort of opposition to Napoleon's um, conquests across Europe, where all across Europe, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, you have you know writers and poets and military leaders who start to sort of identify nationalism as an emotion as this kind of like just innate attachment you feel, this bond you feel with other people from your nation. So this is getting at something deeper than just politics, something deeper than citizenship. This is a type of nationalism that really says that to be French means you simply just like feel that you are French and you just know I am French and all of these people around me are French and we share this thing together that's like in our blood that runs so deep in our history that's going to be a really intense feeling that you know leads to resistance movements against Napoleon leads to more revolutions over the course of the 1800s um, and it's something that does play into the you know unification of Italy and the unification of Germany and quite often then romantic nationalism it's bound up in language and cultural identity as the sort of unifying principle and you start to see just cult cultural expression become sort of wrapped up in nationalism as well. And the one big example of this I know I've used in class is that in Germany, for example, the Grimm brothers, these two like well-educated upper-class dudes in, um, in Germany, they went around Germany collecting folktales from peasants. And they put together this collection of folktales, which have since become very, very famous, that in their view represented this kind of unique German culture that is so deeply rooted in their history that, you know, no one knows when these folk tales were composed for the first time or told for the first time. But simply the fact that all of these peasants shared this like common set of stories showed just how deeply rooted their like national identity and national bond was. And the idea that peasant culture was something to be celebrated and spread was something that was tied into romantic nationalism as well. Now, 
governments in countries like Italy and Germany, and pretty much everywhere across Europe, in England, in France, in Russia, as industrialization occurred, as new technologies became available that allowed just more government, you know, not intrusion, but access to people's daily lives and influence on people's daily lives, you see more very clear government effort at creating new um, senses of national identity and really trying to sort of like turn nationalism into almost a religion, something that would replace, you know, traditional religion as a way of thinking about like your place in the world and your place in the universe. So this is when like most of the modern flags in Europe are created during the 1800s. And flags are a powerful national symbol. And if the same flag is flying from border to border within France or within Germany or England, that is something that is a very sort of powerful symbolic tool. But also, languages are standardized mostly through you know, the primary education system, where basically some standard version and spelling for a language is taught at the earliest ages. And this creates, once again, a sort of linguistic bond that might not have actually been there in earlier days when dialects in different parts of a country were more common. So also public celebrations and holidays, you know, are invented during this time. We already mentioned like schools being sort of vectors for nationalism. And this is when most European countries, with the exception of a couple like Britain, they start to require compulsory military service for men. And this is something that, once again, creates a sort of set of shared experiences for all of the men in their societies to create this kind of bond that wasn't really there before. This idea that belonging to this nation of people and serving this nation of people is what sort of gives you a place in the world. So, now, um, nationalism, though, even though it could unify people within a country, it quite often was a divisive force and would actually sort of separate people or drive wedges between people. So, now one of the biggest factors in this is the idea that, you know, that each nation of people should have self-determination. This is a big, big phrase in the idea of nationalism in the 19th century, self-determination, and really all through the 20th century as well. This idea that each unique or unique nation of people should have the right and the ability to form its own government to have its own leaders, to basically be responsible for its own destiny, and that it was inappropriate for a nation of people to be ruled by a foreign government, you know, to be conquered by an empire, to share government with another group of people. So self-determination, you know, became a really divisive force, especially in the Austrian Empire, which by the end of the century is known as the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire because you know, the Hungarian people within that empire basically demanded, like, full equality with the Austrian people as a show of their, you know, of their sort of unique national identity. But the Russian Empire, nationalism also became a very divisive force there. Although there were efforts by, you know, the Russian government, the czars of the Romanov dynasty, to sort of fabricate, you know, a Russian identity that they would impose even on the minority groups within the country, but ultimately, that was never really quite as successful as they had hoped. Now, the Ottoman Empire also gets kind of torn apart by nationalism, and especially in the Balkans in southeastern Europe, where you have you know Christian communities that looked at themselves as really totally separate from the Ottoman Turks that ruled over them. This is the moment when now they have the sort of ideology, you know, combined with other political and economic factors, to really take the risk of breaking away from the Ottoman Empire. And there are other Europeans willing to help them too. So when like the Greeks and the Serbs and Bosnians become independent from the Ottoman Empire, nationalism is the thing that is driving that independence. So now, of course, we've also talked about nationalism as a source of racism and discrimination. Because if you start thinking, oh, well, each nation of people has its own separate culture and identity and language, well, it's not that big of a leap to then start thinking, well, you know, certain people then are definitely French, but others aren't. And maybe we need to, like, get those people out of our nation. 
or sort of keep them from having influence or the ability to like undermine our nation in some way. So racism and discrimination really sort of intensify as a byproduct of um, nationalism. And um, also you start to see regional and separatist nationalism. So once again, we've talked about the Austrian Empire in places like Hungary, where a nationalist movement there is intending to break away from the Austrian Empire. But also in the United Kingdom, Irish nationalism begins to emerge as a potent divisive force as well. And over the course of a few decades, which culminates in the 1920s, um, this Irish separatist movement will be trying to push for more independence based on sort of separate Irish identity, separate from the British who were ruling over them. In southern Germany, the one big part of Germany that Bismarck and then later German leaders, you know, always had sort of trouble really absorbing into their sort of view of German nationalism was Bavaria, the very southern part of the country. This was the last part of Germany to be absorbed into Prussia's empire in the 1800s. And this is the most Catholic part of Germany, whereas most of the rest of Germany was heavily Protestant by the 1800s. And even as religion becomes less and less important as a sort of defining factor in identity, Bavaria is still going to be a place that kind of looks at itself as somewhat separate culturally from the rest of Germany. So, now, Russia and some of the other smaller countries in the Balkans are going to push for a new sort of supranational identity in the 1800s called Pan-Slavism. And this is going to be this idea that the Slavic peoples of Europe, which included Russians, included, you know, Ukrainians, but also included Croats and Serbs and Bosnians, this idea that they should all be unified or cooperative together in some way. And Russia is going to push this idea partly because it's a way for them to sort of reach their tentacles out into the Balkans and gain more influence in that part of the world. But this is one way that Slavic peoples, in some cases, began to think of themselves. And a, a form of nationalism focused within the Jewish community is going to, going to emerge. So Zionism was founded by a guy named Theodor Herzl, who was a, um, a Jew living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And basically, in the face of rising anti-Semitism as a sort of byproduct of you know, racist nationalism in the late 1800s, basically decided, you know what? Well, the Jewish people should sort of unify and cooperate within themselves as a sort of separate, distinct nation. And he did feel that there was something unique about the Jewish people, you know, as in opposition to the rest of the European nations, even in places where there were a lot of Jewish people living, you know, among um, other European nations. So some um, within the Zionist movement then began to push for Jewish emigration to some particular part of the world, um, which eventually led to the creation of the state of Israel in the Middle East but basically finding like a homeland, a place where the Jewish people would have their own sort of separate nation state and the ability to avoid being, you know, dominated by discriminatory um, governments and people who didn't really sort of look at them as part of their nation. And, you know, as anti-Semitism was becoming really kind of an epidemic by the late 1800s. So we've talked about anti-Semitism in Russia. We've talked about in France, the Dreyfus affair, the, um, Jewish um, army lieutenant who was railroaded and imprisoned for years on basically false charges, basically as an expression of like national identity by more sort of hard line, you know, you could say racist French nationalists, ones who basically said that no, to be French means you are you know, Catholic and you sort of have these sort of deeply rooted aspects of French culture within your identity. So now moving along then. In addition to nationalism, there is another sort of competing form of identity that begins to emerge during the 1800s, and that is class consciousness. And this is something that emerges within the context of the Industrial Revolution, but especially in the context of socialism and Marxism, where within industrial societies, you're belonging in a social class, whether it was the proletariat, the working class, 
or the bourgeoisie, the middle class, also started to become a greater sort of source of personal identity and a sort of way that you knew your place within the world, within society. And increasingly within the socialist movement, you know, socialism is really a sort of international movement at heart, and especially the sort of Marxist version of it. So socialism is going to be something that on some level kind of disconnects working class identity from nationhood and instead tries to create a sort of broader international working class identity that will sort of overcome, you know, the separation of the working class across different nations. So now, you know, some socialist parties will eventually sort of get absorbed into just the political system of their countries, but there will always be a socialist movement that's sort of working at the international level as well over the course of the 1800s and into the 1900s. So, uh, let's see. All right. Now, one of the big tools of, you know, nation building that governments in the late, late 1800s also engaged in was imperialism. And for countries like France, for Germany, for Britain, there were some po or politicians who basically thought that one way to sort of keep the support of the people, to keep them always sort of interested in, you know, supporting the nation, was to basically be sort of constantly involved in these overseas adventures. And, you know, we could debate about exactly what the true motivations were behind some of these attempts at colonization and, you know, empire building around the world. But it's definitely true that the governments of Britain and France and Germany and Belgium and others definitely kind of tried to create this connection between taking colonies and national strength and national greatness and tried to create this attitude that to be a good British person or to be a good French person meant that you supported colonization, that you supported imperialism because, you know, who wouldn't want their nation to become stronger than others and become dominant around the world? Now, obviously, not every European bought into this, but it did become a big sort of tool of nation building um, in the late 1800s. Now, moving along. Finally, then, 20th century. Here we go. So, after World War I, with the exception of the emergent Soviet Union, Europe was dominated by nation states. So, after World War I, then, this is when those former empires, you know, empires like the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, are basically just gone. They're kaput. And in their place, you see all of these new republics emerging. So you see new nation states that quite often are tied to some sort of national or ethnic or linguistic identity. So Poland is drawn back on the map. And Czechoslovakia, which later on will be split up into two even sort of smaller nation states. But the Austrian Republic, Hungary becomes a separate republic, Romania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia um, for a few decades will be a sort of pan-Slavic super state in Southeast Asia, or Asia, Southeastern Europe, the Balkans. So you do start to see, you know, Eastern Europe really kind of dominated by these new nation states, some of which see more success than others at creating stable governments, stable economies. But they are all sort of based on this attitude of self-determination, which Woodrow Wilson was a big proponent of in his 14 points, and you know had been the sort of goal of nationalist movements within those countries for decades. So, um, let's see. Now, um, okay, so the Soviet Union also emerges as kind of a new Russian empire. And at least at first, Lenin... And, you know, his inner circle, when they created the Soviet Union, their goal was to create a sort of supranational empire, not based on nationality, but based on devotion to communism, devotion to Marxist revolution. And even after Stalin started to become a bit more nationalistic and basically used, like, the satellite states of the Soviet Union as essentially just resource banks for the mother country, for Russia... There was still this kind of sense of the Soviet Union as, you know, this new Russian empire. So, um, now during World War II, Germany sought to create a pan-European empire based on an extreme version of German national identity and power. So Nazism and Hitler's view of nationalism, which was based on Mussolini's view of nationalism, which was founded in Italy, 
this becomes a much more sort of destructive and much more sort of competitive and social Darwinistic type of nationalism than ever before, where basically nationhood meant essentially just winning the struggle for survival against other nations and dominating them and absorbing them into an empire and ultimately exterminating them if necessary. So this was kind of the ultimate expression of this kind of racist and imperialistic nationalism that had emerged over the course of the 1800s. So um, now, during the second half of the 20th century, as Europeans recovered from the strain of two world wars, Western European empires fractured and transformed into new political units. So decolonization occurs following World War II, partly because of just like the stress and expense of trying to hold on to empires across the globe. But this does, you know, lead to a sort of new emergence of an identity following World War II, because now like the British Empire is going to basically cease to exist. And people within Britain who were into the empire, who looked at that as a source of national strength and identity, we are the people who have the empire, are going to have to basically sort of reconsider their position in the world and in Europe. So, um, now, you start to see them. As they reconceive the role in a post-war world, Europeans can now identify with larger transnational organizations, such as the European Coal and Steel Community, so the ECSC, or the Community of Countries Assemble Under NATO or the Warsaw Pact. Um, Europeans have increasingly identified as members of the EU, even as regional and national affiliations continue to call into question the idea of a shared European identity. So, during the Cold War, the EU, you know, there will be people who are still very intensely attached to their sort of vision of their nation as a separate thing. But you do start to see more and more people calling for a broader sense of shared na European identity. And especially as, you know, other powers in the world start to emerge. So the United States, the Soviet Union, as China emerges as a superpower again as, you know, parts of the Middle East and Southeast Asia begin, uh, emerge as powers within the world. You start to see some Western Europeans especially starting to view Europe as its own sort of separate civilization that goes beyond just each unique nation within Europe. And you start to see some, you know, very strong advocates of the EU looking at the sort of collective project of Europe you know, including all of the conflicts that have occurred over the centuries as an important part of European identity, and that Europe as a unified thing can become a sort of superpower again based on that sense of shared European identity. But also during the Cold War, NATO, the Warsaw Pact, and the very clear line between West and Eastern Europe is another sort of way of understanding where you sort of fit in to, you know, the world and to Europe. Now, some of the lingering questions um, regarding national identity. First of all, you know, this idea of European identity versus national and local identities. And obviously there are still, you know, countries where Euroscepticism is an incredibly strong attitude. This idea that the idea of a singular unified Europe is nonsense. And instead, we should focus always on our nation and our nation's interests ahead of others. So this has culminated with the Brexit movement of recent years. So this is something that is kind of an open question about where this attitude is going to go. But also, as more and more non-Western migrants have entered Europe, you also start to see um, some European nationalists focusing on Western and European identity as being wrapped up more and more in a particular sort of ethnic or linguistic background separate from, you know, the rest of the world, even as more non-Europeans become part of European society. And, you know, there's still ongoing separatist movements across Europe. So the Basque movement um, in northern Spain, in Flanders, which is part of Belgium, there's an ongoing separatist movement there. And in Ireland, you know, there are those who want to break Northern Ireland out of the UK and reunify it with the rest of Ireland in order to create one single Irish state on the, iron, on the island. And in Spain, in northeastern Spain, around the city of Barcelona, there's a, another independence movement there. In that particular region is called Catalonia. 
So that's something that has also been sort of going on for really centuries now, an effort among people in that particular region to become their own sort of separate nation once again. So, um, any questions? Okay. So let's do some quick... Oh yeah, Scotland. Yeah, they might break away from the UK. Forgot to mention them. There's a bunch more too. The former Yugoslavia. Man, I keep forgetting how much I edited this uh, presentation. So in the former Yugoslavia, as the breakup there occurred in the 90s, basically those countries have been getting broken into smaller and smaller constituent states as sort of unique local national identities have become more and more potent and vocal. So, now once again, when you're doing these thematic reviews, it's important to sort of constantly question yourself and question the information that you're seeing and think about changes occurring over time, continuities occurring over time. How do later moments within that theme compare to earlier moments in that theme? So, um, you know, so some questions you might want to ask yourself about um, the things we've gone over. What significant changes occurred in European conceptions of identity and belonging between 1450 and the present? Sorry, my face is blocking part of those words there. Uh, what aspects of European conceptions of identity and belonging showed continuity between 1450 and the present? And then what has been the influence of nationalism on European politics and society since 1789? Has the influence of nationalism changed over time? So. I think I'll stop the recording there, and everyone watching on YouTube, I'll see you in class. Bye.